feel like Bruce Buffer just told me it's time. History! Oh! UFC history! Pittsburgh Steelers have won the Super Bowl for a sixth time. I think they're ready for a show. Why are you late, bro? You have to be professional. <laughs> we are not enjoyed <laughs> by the oh. greatest... Oh. DC, you broke my heart. DC always hates on you on this show. <laughs> <laughs> So now, hold on, after you and I put each other in the face, he's going to sit back down and play chess. To be with one of the greats, talking about a great sport, you can't beat that. What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of DC and RC. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's my boy, Ryan Clark. RC, where are you? this day and age, man. Like, where you at, my guy? You know, right now, I'm in Washington, D.C. The training camp tour has started, and this is what we do. We just pivot, man, and you pivot straight from one podcast that's great to another podcast that's great, and now I'm here with my boy, D.C., to talk a little BMF. The Washington Commanders. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. What a name. The Washington Commanders. (laughs) Guys, coming up on the show... We are going to break down UFC 291. In about 15 minutes, we're joined by Michael Chiesa. And we'll also list the top five BMF fighters of all time. But, RC, I got to say something real quick before we get into the breakdown. Every time I watch the opener of the show and it says, the Pittsburgh Steelers have won the championship for the fifth time, I seem to get happy for you, bro. I smile like it's (laughs) happening right now because you look so happy. Dog, what did that feel like? (laughs) Bro, it was it was crazy, DC, because actually in that picture, what you're seeing is relief. I was laying in the confetti, bro. I was just so happy we didn't lose. We were winning that game. Larry Fitzgerald starts going crazy in the fourth quarter. And me, Ike, and Troy are like, we're about to lose the game for the entire city because we couldn't stop Larry Fitzgerald. So I was more so just freaking happy that it was over. Dog, you were happy because you had a moment, right? We live for moments in this big life that we're so blessed to be able to live. But guess who else has the opportunity to have a massive moment from Salt Lake City? Dustin Poirier or Justin Gaethje? Yeah. The moment is at their fingertips to become the BMF champion. But not only that, to create another memory, a memory of another Justin Gaethje fight, another Dustin Poirier fight, that absolutely is going to be bananas. Most times, Ryan, as in movies, the sequels aren't as good as the original. Can this one live up to it? Because all the evidence say that putting these two in the octagon again is going to be better than the first time. You know what, I think the thing is, both of these fighters are better fighters at this juncture of their career. They're both still as daring, but you can see the way that they've changed tactically, the different skill sets they possess, and then they still know how to go out and be that fearless type of fighter that we've seen Michael Chandler step into the octagon against both of these men in the last two years. I'm excited to see what Justin Gaethje changes this time in facing Dustin Poirier. Recently, Dustin Poirier posted a picture of what his legs looked like after the fight the first time with Justin Gaethje, so you know that those legs will be attacked. But how will Justin adjust to the way Dustin picked him apart on his feet by using his boxing? That's what I'm looking forward to. But the one thing we know about both of these men, they will not back down, they will not quit, and they ain't turning away from no smoke. And that's what makes this so exciting. I want to add something this time to the BMF sort of title, DC. These two dudes are championship level fighters. Make no mistake about that. This isn't, let's take Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal, who I truly respect as mixed martial artists and also just bad mother efforts. But They weren't on the level that these two fighters are on. Not only can this be for the BMF, this is probably setting up one of these men to fight the winner of Charles Oliveira, Islam Mahachev, and Abu Dhabi. You know, that's that's a great point, right? Because Islam even said it, right? I spoke to him on on my, my YouTube channel, and he said, 
The BMF title list for bums. He goes, who fought for it last time? Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal? You can't say that this time, RC. You can't say, yep. and by no means am I calling these guys bums. I'm saying that the idea no. to some, because they were guys that had so many losses, was that this was a bit of a paper belt. Now you got two championship caliber guys, guys that have fought for the UFC title six times, fighting for a BMF championship, mm -hmm. so the belt is elevated. But so is the skill set of Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier. You got to remember back in 2018 yeah. when they fought the first time. Gaethje was still very new to the UFC. He was still a guy that had not reached the mountaintop. But I believe that when I look at these two guys, for as good as they've become technically and tactically, I think the championship level experience will allow for the confidence to be higher. So it's not just about what they can do inside the octagon between the eight sides of the octagon cage. It's about what's between the ears for these two now. Because there is nothing more important, RC, than Dana White stepping behind you and putting the belt on you. I don't care that it was the interim. I don't care that it wasn't the full championship. When he puts that belt on you, you have a moment in time that are unmatched by many in this fight profession. So for these guys to carry the confidence of a champion into Salt Lake City is a big deal. And I asked both of them very recently, are you in Salt Lake? Yes, they both went early to try and acclimate because the altitude, dude, is crazy. And we saw that taking effect on some of the fighters that showed up late to Utah the last time we went there last summer. Hey, DC, if anybody ain't messing with no altitude, you already know it's your boy. So you ain't got to tell me <laughs> that altitude is different. It almost took me out when I played in Denver. But when I talked to Leon, and Leon was trying to explain to me what happened in the Kamaru fight, why he felt his legs were heavy, or how he was kind of dominated and held up against the cage, he said he just didn't have any legs, that he couldn't get himself to kind of get going. And so I do think that that plays a part for all of these fighters, I want to talk about something that I noticed as a fan, DC, and I'm sure you can explain this a little bit better for me, being a two-division champion. I was sitting cage side for the first time, octagon side, when I got an opportunity to watch Justin Gaethje fight Rafael Fazeev. And the, at the beginning of the fight, Fazeev seemed quicker. He seemed faster. He was kind of darting in and out. And I watched Justin Gaethje, and I was looking at his face, and when Fazeev would do something or get off before him he just fix his gloves he'd take a deep breath deep breath and he just get back to it and then I also think about Dustin Poirier with Michael Chandler where Michael Chandler started that fight fast as well well Dustin Poirier shrugs his shoulders puts his set up and continues to move forward after taking a deep breath is there something about those championship fights or being inside the octagon with the uh, Khabib uh, Habib no more the the Charles Oliveras that kind of hardens you and gives you a sense of poise in those moments when you're fighting against fighters who may be having a moment but allows you to understand that there's more to this fight than just having one moment. It has to be a consistent thought process of continuing to wear your opponent down. You know, RC, it's like, it's like the most high-level game of chess that you've ever seen right? It's Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier staying present in the moment, even knowing that they're getting beat. Because Justin Gaethje, make no mistake yeah. about it, was losing to Rafael Fazi. He was yes. losing. But he was able yep. to just kind of yep. settle himself, recenter, and get back to work. And so was Dustin Poirier. It's those types of situations. Making that walk. Bro, you got to think, right? They both fought Habib. But they both fought Habib in Abu Dhabi. They had to make that walk in enemy territory, knowing they were fighting against a dominant guy that could take them down and exploit them in areas that they really never had to worry about so much. They went into a country that they were booed. Those guys don't get booed. They're too fun to get booed. They have been in situations yeah. that have hardened them. So when you're standing in front of a guy that's just getting off faster than you, that's landing at a faster rate, all you got to do is settle your mind. Because the worst thing you can do in those big spots is rush. Because when you start to rush, you start to make mistakes. It's the same thing you don't overthink in football. A guy runs past you and makes mm -hmm. a long catch RC, you say, well, next play I do it better. That's what you do in fighting, and that's what yep. you see in Justin Gaethje. So these guys have these little ticks, right? Maybe it's the gloves of, of Gaethje. Poirier yep. kind of shakes yeah. his head like, okay, let's do this. 
It's just these little things mm -hmm. that tell them I'm back to where I am and I, I know that I can still get this done. Yeah, those sort of things, those little bitty, those little, those little movements are some of the things that tipped me off, that they were just sort of recentering themselves after knowing their yep. opponent got a good shot. Or, or Dustin Poirier, when he hits Conor McGregor in the second fight and he points at him like, okay, like we see what's happening. You can mm -hmm. tell that things are moving more slowly for them inside the octagon than they are for someone like me with the untrained eye from the outside. But there's a another fight that's going to be I guess featuring two bad MFers as well when we talk about Jan Bohovitz and the debut of Alex Pereira in the light heavyweight division to move up after fighting Israel Adesanya two times at middleweight to fight Jan Bohovitz who is a former champion in the light heavyweight division that says what the organization believes and thinks of Pereira but when you look at him DC and taking this step up, what could be some of the challenges for Alex when he's facing a guy like Jan Bohovitz, who will be the bigger man and the better grappler? You know, you know, for me, RC, it tells me that the UFC is looking at what we're looking at, that Alex Pajeda is massive. And there's no reason why he should have been able to make 185 pounds. He's a 230-pound man, and he looks every bit of a light heavyweight. But what it also tells me is not to rush to judgment. Because when Israel Adesanya fought against Jan Bohovic, right? Because we all look for common factors and common denominators. Izzy got taken down by Jan, and that's why he lost the fight. Izzy weighed 197 pounds when he walked into the octagon to fight Jan Bohovic. But Hader will be big. He will be heavy. I bet he weighs about 220 when he goes into the octagon. So you would imagine that that extra size will help him with the takedown defense. But with Jan Bohovic, you know that he possesses knockout power and he also possesses the yeah. ability to take you down and grind you out. He's so heavy from the mm -hmm. top that he can really wear on Alex Pajeda. And for as much as Pajeda has done in this short period of time, RC, he has not have to deal with a bigger, stronger grappler. Now, am I saying that he's not ready to do that? Right. No. I'm saying that even in the fight that he got challenged in the wrestling, it was at 185 and he was able to make his way back to his feet. Izzy was stuck mm -hmm. when Jan took him down. Can Bohovic employ that same yep. type of strategy? And can Bohovic do that at altitude and be able to do it consistently for 15 minutes? Ryan, this fight now has way higher stakes because Jamal Hill yes. will not be the champion once the next title fight starts. So it's a, it's a, it's a big fight, and it might put the winner in place to fight the returning Yuri Prohachka. Well, I think it's a, it's a huge fight for this reason. When we look at Pajeda, it's the excitement that surrounds his style of fighting. What we got to see him do versus Sean Strickland, the way he finishes Izzy with the TKO in the fifth round. There's always that element, and I'm not saying that these fighters are the same level because I know Pajeda was able to gain the middleweight championship. There's that Rumble Johnson element that this could end at any time based off the power that this man possesses on the feet. And so I'm excited to see how that plays or how that fares at 205. And if you're Jan Bohovitz coming off of a fight where you had an opportunity to regain the title that ends in the draw, you have to be nipping at the bud or nipping at the bit to get to Alex Pajeda and put yourself back in that position to face a returning Yuri Prohaska when he's recovered from his shoulder surgery. This division is in, it's such in flux where whether it's Yuri or Glover or Jan or Jamal that someone like Alex Pajeda can really come in and cement himself as a true championship contender with a dynamic finish of Jan Bohovitz. You know, and the one thing about Alex, Ryan, and you and I will agree, he's got to be a little more present defensively because he can be hurt. We've seen yes. him hurt against yeah. Izzy multiple times. At 205, these guys carry much more power. And if he's taking those shots, they will put him out. It's crazy because the excitement that surrounds this fight card could be based on these two fights. But there's more. UFC 291 is one of the best fight cards we've had in a long time. So you got Steven Thompson taking on Michelle Pineda. Then you got Tony Ferguson and Bobby Green. You got the Black Beast Derek Lewis taking on Marcos Hajario de Lima. 
and Michael Chiesa faces a Kevin Holland. Guys, this is going to be one of the best fight cards we have had in a really long time. So we figured let's chat with one of the fighters from that fight card, and we are going to go one round with Michael Chiesa. Michael Chiesa is a guy that works on television, but today he's at his day job getting ready to fight in the <laughs> UFC's octagon. What's up, Mike? How you doing, my guy? Doing good, fellas. It's good to be uh, chatting with you guys. Mike, you are on the eve of a big-time fight with Kevin Holland. How are you feeling? How long have you been in Salt Lake City to try to acclimate to the altitude that will always play a part in these fights? I feel really good. You know, I had all the right training partners. I trained with the Urbina brothers a lot. Um, you know, Gilbert, he, he's a guy that's a welterweight, a big welterweight at that. Um, and for the altitude, I lived in Mount Charleston and trained down low in Las Vegas. So it was really good for me to, to live at the altitude, train low, and still get the benefits of training at the UFC Performance Institute, as well as, you know, syndicate. And I brought all my teammates from back home. So Brady Heese and Ashton Charlton, my coach Rick Little. So I got the best of both worlds. It just worked out for me to be able to address the altitude while staying close to Las Vegas. Um, so it wasn't necessary for me to come to Salt Lake early. So I just got here last night. You know, when you're facing Kevin Holland, who is a long, rangy, diverse striker, there's a lot of different ways that he can attack you. What do you feel are some of the dangers when you're facing someone like him inside the octagon? You know, it, it's easy to talk about the X's and O's with Kevin Holland. You know, he, he's got that, he's got a ferocious right hand. He's very, very long. He likes to use his sidekicks. Um, but it's really not the skill set that I feel like is his best attribute. It's how game he is. This guy is a fighter's fighter. He, he, he's willing to go in there and scrap with anybody at any weight class at any time. So it makes it easy for him to implement his game. Um, so it was, it was very necessary for me to bring in long training partners. Um, and I also had another guy, Daryl Walker, who uh, had a ton of kickboxing experience but did a lot of traditional martial arts. So he was able to bring in a lot of those kicks, a lot of the side kicks, a lot of the spinning attacks. So I really feel like this camp, I dotted my I's and crossed my T's in terms of addressing the skills that Kevin brings to the octagon, the frame, the size, and the challenges. You know, there are going to be a lot of challenges in the octagon this weekend. But Mike, at times, we have seen you look phenomenal in the striking, but ultimately your game is to make the fight a little dirty, yes. make it a little ugly, wear mm -hmm. on guys, grab on them, drag them down to the floor and make them grapple with you. Is it as simple as that with Kevin Holland? Because Kevin Holland is also a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt once you get him to the ground. And not only that, he's got a good Darce choke. And what has been one of my kryptonites of the past, Daniel Cormier? <laughs> yeah, the Darce choke. I don't see you get with the Darce. I don't see you get with the Darce, I, I yeah, yeah, you get with the darts about five times don't in your do. career. <laughs> uh, see you get, I don't see you get about five times with a Darce choke. I don't know why you haven't addressed that yet. <laughs> dude, he, he's a well-rounded fighter. You gotta like, you, you gotta give him his flowers, dude. He he can grapple, he can strike, and I feel like people are so asphyxiated on how good he is at striking, they feel like they can exploit him on the ground, but. He showed in the Tim Means fight. You know, he's got a really good dart choke. He's got really good catches. So we made sure to address that. I, I feel like, you know, going into the Vicente Luque fight, I didn't address that as much as I should have. But, uh, you know, I feel like I, I feel like I'm ready to, to 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 fight wherever this fight takes place. You know, whether it's on the feet or it's on the ground, I'll be very well prepared to fight Kevin Holland. But you know, I'm going to fight my style of fight. I'm going to make it dirty. I'm going to make it nasty. And I'm going to get my hand raised. You know, you haven't fought since late 2021, and you're coming in as the 12th ranked fighter in the welterweight division, fighting a guy in Kevin Holland who very well, based on his skill, could be a ranked fighter, but that isn't. What are the risks in taking on a fight like this and how it could affect your seating or your ranking in the UFC if you don't fight well or lose? I'm not here to preserve my number next to my name. I'm here to fight. Like, I... I'm so eager to get in there and scrap. It's been so long. I'm not going to nitpick and, and play the political game. I've been doing that for a long time. Yeah. I've been in the rankings since 2015. So for me, it's about fighting the right fight. I think had I got to fight in Miami, I would still be fighting Kevin Holland this Saturday. So this the, we've, okay. we've just been on a collision course. So I'm just excited for this fight. And you got to remember, this is a guy that was knocking on the door of title contention in the weight class above. You know, this guy was knocking on the door to fight mm -hmm. for the middleweight title at one point in time. So uh, I look at that more than I look at him not having a number next to his name. I really like the challenge, and I like that he's going to bring the fight to me.
Mike, how do you deal with the chatter? There's going to be chatter in there. <laughs> Have you tried to kind of figure out how you're going to deal with the chatter, right? Kevin, not only talking to you, but talking to anyone that's within earshot about what he's going to do inside the octagon to you. I have a funny story about that. So for me, you know, I'm a pretty game fighter, so don't be surprised if I start talking back to him in there. But I was having a sparring session back home, and Chase Hooper was in town training. Chase, the teenage dream Hooper. And out of nowhere, he goes, (laughs) Let's go, mother. Starts talking crap to me. I was like, Hooper. I don't know. Chase like Hooper. The nicest guy. <laughs> Chase Hooper just started lipping off to me, dude. It was so funny. But look, I know what Kevin brings to the table, bro. I've been watching him a long time, and I'm a game fighter myself. So if he starts talking, don't be surprised if I start talking back. It's just part of his game, and I'm very well aware of it. You know, we've seen fighters have what we consider long layoffs and some of them have a little octagon rust and we've seen some people come off of the layoffs refreshed and ready to go. How do you feel the layoff has affected you as you prepare to enter the octagon this weekend? I I don't think it's going to affect me at all. I've had long layoffs before. Um, I don't believe in ring rust. I believe in camp rust. I believe in when you haven't had a training camp for a long time, It's more about knocking off the rust to get in the rigors of a training camp, to deal with the high volume of training, the sparring, the wrestling, kind of putting it all together. Uh, And fortunately for me, the blessing in disguise of not getting to fight in Miami was I got a full camp underneath my belt. So I was able to shake that rust off Mm. for the training camp rust headed into this fight. But I've had layoffs before, and they've never affected me. I've always shown up, and I've always fought. So um, ring rust will not be a factor on Saturday. All right, Michael Kiesa, so most people won't do this because they're not that confident, but Ryan and I are really, really good at our jobs. So we're going (laughs) to let you tell us analytically about the main event. Now, hey, we're just both really good, Mm. so we don't have egos. So we will give you the platform. Talk to us as Michael (laughs) Kiesa, the analyst, because even though you haven't been fighting, you have been working quite a bit and you do a great job on television. Talk to us about that main event. What do you think is going to happen? That's a fun fight, right? Well, I can tell you what's going to happen. The writing's on the wall. These guys are going to meet in the middle of the octagon. I don't think either guy's going to take a backward step, and they're going to fight. The I think the big X factor on the side of Justin Gaethje is can he stay within himself like he did against Rafael Fazid? Can he fight a more technical fight? Every fight he's going to be in is going to be exciting, even if he stays smart and fights technically. The only problem is... That jab that he used against Fazeev, the jab that he used against Fazeev won't be in play because Dustin's a southpaw. So he's going to have to lead with the with yep. the right hand a little bit more. And for Dustin, mm. it's just going to be if he gets rattled to stay composed and not back straight up. We saw Michael Chandler kind of get him backing up on that center line a little bit. And you don't want to do that against Justin yeah. Gaethje. So, uh, you know, there's a reason why these guys are in this main event. And I think that it validates yeah. the BMF title having these two guys fight each other because they are the cream of the crop at lightweight. If there wasn't a guy named Habib Nurmagomedov that was once at the top of the mountain, yeah. either one of these guys could be world champion. Mike, you know what's that's, crazy, That's absolutely true, and I think... Mike, the, why, why are you cutting me off? So, so sorry, RC, <laughs> because he made a great point, RC. Like, that is honestly, RC, how the first fight ended because, because Justin yeah. tried to use his leg kicks opposed to the jab And when he was throwing the blind leg Mm -hmm. kick, Dustin Poirier countered with the left hand, which is his backhand, which ultimately led to the finish. Hey, great pickup, Kiesa. Right, Ryan? Great pickup, Mike. Hey, Hey, I'm just trying to be like you, This is what you guys do, man. (laughs) Hey, this is what you guys do. We got to bring back detail in some kind of way and get you and Michael Kiesa to do like a tag team joint like me and Dan do on Tuesdays on NFL Live. Mm That would be dope. I like I'll that. definitely tune into that. You know what I'm saying? Michael, so later on, DC and I are going to list our top five BMFs of the UFC of all time. If you had an opportunity to just pick one guy who you think is the BMF of all BMFs of the UFC, who would that one dude be for you? Man, uh, this is going to be an odd answer. I, I, I might put Kevin Holland at the top of that list. This is a guy that has, anytime there's a fight available, doesn't matter what weight class, that guy has made the call, that guy's made the call out. He's a guy that it, down the line, maybe after this fight, 
I don't think things are going to go very well for him. Um, yeah. But I think down the line, he could be a guy that maybe be the third person to fight for the BMF title, the third to be in the third matchup. But um, outside yeah. of that, man, I would, I would pick cool. a guy. Yeah, I mean, it's an anytime, anywhere, any place type of thing. It's something that should have went to Cowboy Cerrone. So um, off the top of my he head, tripping. I'm kind of... Yeah. I, outside yeah, of that, I'd probably Mike, say. Yeah, outside of that, you outside disagree? of that, I'd probably. Outside of Mike that, I'd trip. Outside, you're tripping. <laughs> outside of that, I'd probably go. Hospital. I mean, he won the first one, and uh, you know, he'd probably be the guy at the top of my list as well. Hey, I gotta hype my opponent, bro. <laughs> you know, you know how this works, DC. RC, yeah, you, hype RC, you know how to work. I RC, you say bye to. RC, you say bye to him, man. You say bye to him, RC. I'm mad Michael. at him now. You say Michael. bye to him. Thank you. Hey, man. <laughs> Thank you so much, brother. Best of luck this weekend. Can't wait to see you step back inside of the octagon. Thanks, fellas. Take it easy. <laughs> The man, man, appreciate the man. you. Yes, DC, sir. why you going on, why you going hard on Mike like that, man? The man is just saying he Bro, believes because... that Kevin Holland is also a bad mother effort. That's like if yeah. we were fighting, now I wouldn't say that about you because I don't believe that about you. So you're right. Never mind. I wouldn't tell that lie. RC, I RC. Wouldn't tell a lie. You're RC, a like, here's pooch the, thing. Of the UFC. Oh my god. I got that Dana White privilege. Hey RC, no, listen. Dana the, uh, <laughs> the reality. <laughs> The reality is this, RC. The reality is this. Bro, this guy, Kevin Holland, will fight anybody, anytime, anywhere. So what the BMF title originally was thought to be, yes, I would put him in that category for sure. Hey, but, RC, we're going to do that BMF list in a little bit. But big news last week. Islam Mahachev is taking on Charles Oliveira for the second time. So what's the biggest story, RC? that the rematch has been made or for the second time we have had fighters go, I'm not doing it quite yet. Yeah. And also let me make that decision to fight. Because remember, Aljo was like, I'm not fighting until July. Aljo yep. fought in, in, in Newark, New Jersey against Henry Cejudo early. Now he's fighting Sean O'Malley again. Oliveira was very August. adamant that he was not fighting again. Now he's fighting Islam in Abu Dhabi. What is it, RC? Is it the money? Are they backing up the Briggs truck for the boy Dubronx? Because he's ready for that fight. You know what? I'm going to say this. I, I don't know how the money works in the UFC, but I do know the UFC will move forward without you. Right, the UFC is not <laughs> waiting on fighters. This is a this is an organization. This is a a a, a boat that's going to keep floating along, no matter if you jump in or you're not in. And so I think for a guy like Charles Oliveira, who had put himself right back in contention with his win over Benil Dariush, they say, look, either you fight or you don't. But this is happening. Islam Mahachev will have an opponent. He will fight the next contender. And I'm pretty sure, though, if you're Charles Oliveira and you're the former champion at that weight class and they're trying to get you or incentivize you to fight early, they gave you a little bit of that dough. Well, you know what the problem is with that? You know what the problem with that is, uh, RC? I think for the first time, and I think the UFC had to make the fight. This is the first time that I feel the UFC had to have Charles Oliveira. You want me to tell you why? Because it's the same situation as Drake is Duplessis and Izzy. Right now, it seems like Duplessis is not going to be able to fight against Edesanya because the turnaround was too quick. Oliveira needed to fight because I can't imagine Poirier Gaethje is going to be healthy. And everybody else in the top five have lost. Benil Daryush has just lost. Michael Chandler has just lost. There was no one else. But it was also the right fight. They had to make it happen, and I believe that they were able to come to an agreement to make this fight happen again. This is a tremendous fight, and I do believe that this fight will play out more to what round one of the first fight looked like because I thought that even though Oliveira got taken down in the first round, I thought he did a very good job of limiting the damage he took, and I thought he did a very good job of making Mahachev work in all situations. Now... Do I believe that Mahachev is going to submit him again? I don't feel confident enough to make that prediction. But I do feel, and I can almost guarantee, that this will be much more difficult for Islam, even though he doesn't feel like it's going to be more difficult. 
Yeah, I think that's what's exciting about this fight is we've seen both men in the octagon since that fight. We got to watch Islam Mahachev take on Alexander Volkanovsky, and we watched Volk do an amazing job of defending on the ground, not getting submitted, being able to end up in top position as the fifth round came to an end. And so I think seeing some of those things and Charles Oliveira getting an opportunity to study those as great as he is a submission artist, as great as he is on the ground, there is something that he can glean from that going into the next fight. And I do believe the dominance that he showed over Benil Dariush is also something that can give him a level of confidence headed into this fight where he was coming off of missing weight and losing his belt against Justin Gaethje to now being in a better position, probably mentally, physically, and emotionally. This is a huge announcement. And I think it's great to build excitement for this fight in this rematch between Charles Oliveira and Islam Mahachev. But in your mind, DC, should this have been something that was announced after we watch Poirier Gaethje this weekend? I just I just think that it, it, it doesn't really hurt the decision because I just know that there's no way these guys come out of that fight healthy enough to turn around and fight again in October. Right? These guys are going to need time. You know, it's August, September, October. If they were to fight in Abu Dhabi, they would have about 10, 11 weeks to prepare themselves. So they only get three weeks to get healthy. This fight this weekend is going to be a barn burner, and it's going to be evenly matched, and these guys are going to get beat up. So they're going to need time to recover after they fight each other this weekend. So I don't know that the timing hurts. I do know, though, that you have the two best fighters in the division fighting each other. Because like you said, his dominance over Benil Dariush was very impressive, RC. But I think what was most impressive to me in that fight was that for the first time in a long time, we saw Oliveira take no damage. We didn't see him have to get up off his yeah. back after getting knocked yeah. down. We didn't see him get hurt. We didn't see him do anything that was considered a negative outside of getting taken down, right? He did everything right in that fight, so it showed that he's at least trying to evolve. And an evolved version of Charles Oliveira is a better fight for Islam Makachev, especially RC after watching Alexander Volkanovsky for the first time make Makachev yes. look human inside the octagon. Yeah, and I think that's what's the excitement that's built for this fight. We've seen Islam Mahachev look human inside the octagon and also seen Charles Oliveira rebound from losing his belt, then losing the opportunity to regain it, and then showing himself against Benil Dariush, who at the time was a top four contender in his weight class. But also but what's been announced is Hamzat Chemaev will fight Paulo Costa, and we finally get to see him back inside the octagon. There's been so many different rumors of Hamzat Chemaev and who his next opponent will be. And now we know, DC, how excited are you to see him get back in there? And what can you expect from this fight? It's a very exciting fight, RC. And it's, I was talking to Habib just the other day. I asked him for a favor. And uh, um, it's, it's kind of crazy what I asked him for. I, I asked this dude, Habib, for someone to come and wrestle in the United States because I want my Oklahoma State to win. So I was like, give me a couple Dagestanis. And he just told me it's becoming very difficult for Russian athletes to get into the U.S. So maybe that's why we have not seen Hamzat. So it's been a long time. But he gets a fight against a guy now who immediately puts him into title contention at middleweight. If he beats Paulo Costa, you have to say he could be next for Edesanya versus Sean Strickland winner or Edesanya versus Drakus winner. You could move him right away into the title pitcher at 185, and we already know that he's in the title pitcher at 170. This is a big matchup for him, though, because Paulo Costa is dangerous, and it's a hard fight yeah. for Hamza Chemaev, or at least you expect it to be a hard fight for Hamza Chemaev. But when you look at Hamza and what he has done in such a short period of time, you are so impressed. He beat a former number one in Gilbert Burns at 170, and now he's fighting the guy in Paulo Costa who was also a number one in the title contender at 185. So regardless of what you feel about the kid, RC, that kid is not afraid of any fight, and it looks like he's willing to take any fight in any weight class. So maybe that's a guy that should be considered for the BMF championship. But one more question I got to ask you. Uh, 
He had a fight, Paulo Costa. He was supposed to fight the other Russian guy. What happened? I don't even remember when that fight got canceled. Hey. I don't know the kid's name. Hey. The Russian hey. kid that won his first UFC fight, and then he just didn't happen. What happened? Bro, Paulo, pa Paulo Costa is like some mythical creature that you truly never know <laughs> what's going on with him, and it only matches what's been going on with Hamzat Chemaev over the last year. And so this is the perfect fight to make for both of these men. But the fact that you can say if Hamzat Chemaev wins this fight, it immediately puts him in contention in the middleweight division is a testament to what he's already accomplished, whether it be beating Gilbert Burns the three fight run he had during COVID. He has truly put himself not only at the forefront of every fan in the UFC, but Dana White and the matchmakers because they know that he comes to fight and he takes on all comers. But D DC, we're about to list the top five BMF fighters of the entire UFC time, right? All time. Do not cheat, DC. You get five spots. I won't, I won't. Only do five. I'm only doing five today. And I got to pull list. my phone out because I sent Corporate Jake my list yesterday. Look at his boat grabbing our phones. <laughs> Corporate Jake, why don't you speak <laughs> in my ear and just tell me who number five is so I can wax poetic? I mean, you got the God, Mike. Let your boy know, Corporate Jake. At number five, I have Cowboy Cerrone. All right. There was a time where Donald Cerrone fought so many people, right? And RC, it was like Fresno State football back in the day. On the field, it said anybody, anytime. They were a mid-major that played anybody, and they made a name for themselves. That's exactly what Cowboy Cerrone did. At number four, I got Nate Diaz, who was a part of the original BMF championship fight. He's another guy that when you think that term, he pops to your mind. At number three, I got that Lafayette hard body, Dustin Poirier. That dude Not hard is body. nasty. <laughs> Hard body, Lafayette, hard body, Dustin Poirier, a dude that is willing to fight anyone. At number two, I got Justin Gaethje, dog, another one of those guys that is just tremendous and will show up anytime against anybody. Justin Gaethje has 11 fight bonuses in eight or nine UFC appearance or 10 maybe. And at number one, I got Game Bread, Jorge Masvidal, because the belt was made for a reason. If he's the original champion, he is still the BMF champion, RC. He's the BMF champion until a new BMF champion is crowned this weekend. He is a guy that made a name for himself in a year where he just really exploded. He went from being a guy that was kind of middling to knocking out Ben Askren, Darren Till, and Nate Diaz in a year, wearing a belt put on him by The Rock. He's a BMF. He's a guy that fights in the street. He's a guy that fights anywhere, and he's my number one. Well, DC, I went a little differently. When you talk to Islam Mahachev, he said that the BMF was like some made-up title for middle ground fighters because it was Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal. So I kind of thought to myself, you know, they don't actually have to be middle ground fighters. So I started at number yeah. five with Frankie Edgar. Frankie Edgar was a guy to me that I felt like embodied being a BMF. He was smaller than a lot of the people he stepped inside the octagon with, and he not only went toe-to-toe -to -toe with these dudes, he won. Getting in there with BJ Penn and finding a way to win that belt. I think Frankie Edgar truly embodies everything it is to be a bad dude. The dude that no matter when you're walking down the street, how big the person is that's walking from the other side, he's willing to throw hands. At number four, I went Justin Gaethje. That's self-explanatory DC for all the reasons that you mentioned. At number three, I said Rumble Johnson. And here's why. I never looked at Rumble Johnson Johnson and thought to myself, he's the most skilled martial artist I've ever seen. I looked at Rumble Johnson and thought to myself, if I was finna get in a fight on Bourbon Street, that's a dude I want with me. I know he ain't gonna be scared, and if that right hand touch a chin, somebody's going to sleep. At number two, I went DC, and here's my reason. When I look at you, nothing about you screams elite level athlete. When I talk to you and hang around you, my daughter's love for you and calling you the big teddy bear doesn't it scream natural born killer but whether it was John Jones Stipe Miocic Dan Henderson Rumble Johnson the Black Beast all of those dudes you stepped in the octagon it didn't matter you ain't have no picture
picks and chooses, it was time to throw hands. And that I respect. And at number one, I'm going Max Holloway. Anyone, DC, in the world that can be punched on and kicked on as much as Max Holloway and not only not be knocked out, but not be knocked down is a bad man. Any dude that in two separate fights, in one of the fights against Calvin Cater, he was talking to you, DC. He's boxing and talking to you at the same time about him being the varsity <laughs> level and the best boxer in the UFC. And then he beats Brian Ortega so badly, he's teaching him how to block in the middle of the fight. If that ain't a BMF, I don't know what a BMF is. Yeah, RC, that's a great list, but the reality is, take it back. Nothing screams elite-level athlete. Are you crazy? I am the definition of elite-level athlete. You look at me, I run fast, I jump high, I can do everything. You don't. You do not. You do none of those things, DC. You eat a lot, RC. you talk a lot, and you can fight. RC. That's what you do. RC, I beat you off the line on a slant route. Let's not act like I didn't beat you off the line on a slant route. I have the video. Let's tap DC, in or tap DC, out like I tap RC off the 18 line. 18 steps in one spot. One spot, 18 <laughs> steps. Let's go, Corbett Jake. All right, guys. Tom Aspinall made an emphatic return this past weekend, knocking out Tybora in 90 Ooh. seconds. He is back as a top contender at heavyweight. So, RC, tap in or tap out. Aspinall will be a heavyweight champion in 12 months' time. Whoa, that's big. I tap in. Mm. I tap in because I don't know if John Jones continues to fight after fighting Stipe Miocic, whether he wins or loses. And I think that Tom Aspinall will be a guy along with Sergey Sergey uh, Pavlovich who will be fighting for a championship. And right now, watching him on his feet, how quick he is, where he darts in and out, how he finishes, also as great as he is on the ground, Tom Aspinall is a guy that I tap in on being a champion in the year. I tap out. I tap out because guess what? I kind of agree with Jones. I kind of agree with Jones. Jones said something today. He said, I've been here forever, and it's always the next guy is the great thing. I think we shouldn't rush to judgment because for as good as he looked, he 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 still hasn't fought that guy that's going to try to wrestle him the whole time. He still hasn't fought some of these higher-level guys because Tybura, while he's tough, we have seen that happen to him on a number of occasions yeah, over the course of his UFC sure. career. Does Tom Aspinall hold the belt at some point? I do believe that. In the next year, I'm not sure. Corporate Jake. Also this past weekend, following her loss, Molly McCann announced on social media she is going to move down to strawweight. DC, tap in or tap out on McCann moving down to 115. I mean, I, I, mean, I tap in on, on the change. I tap. I don't. I don't know what the change does. I love Molly. And that, that's why it makes for these conversations to be hard. But until she fixes her submission defense, I don't think it matters what weight class she's in because there are great grapplers yeah. at 115 pounds. So I think that Molly McCann's issue is going to be the skill set more than the weight class that she's fighting at. It's not necessarily her skill, her, her weight class. I think she needs to shore up some of those holes in the skills because, RC, it was great matchmaking yeah. that allowed for her to get on that run, and now she's yes. in, in with fighters that aren't as good of a matchup, and they're finishing her, not only beating her. Yeah, I tap in on the move because that means she's at least trying to do something. I just don't know how much that helps Molly McCann moving forward when it comes to figuring out ways to stop being submitted. All right, guys. Earl Spence and Terrence Crawford finally face off this weekend for bragging rights as the best pound-for-pound -pound boxer in the world. RC, tap in or tap out. Spence Crawford lives up to the hype. I tap in. These are two dudes that are meant to fight. Errol Spence sat down and said he believes that Terrence Crawford is his dance partner, and Terrence Crawford is just freaking mean. Like, in talking to the dude, like, he wants to fight me, he wanted to fight Chan, he wanted to fight Fred. I'm sure if he saw Daniel, he'd want to fight him too. He wants to go out there and get a finish. This is about his legacy, but for him, it's about being a BMF as well. I think this lives up to the hype, and I don't see it going every single round. You know, I, I think this fight lives up to it because they're too good not to. 
This will be a fun fight. I only wonder what will be the kickback of the Aero Spence accident. When you have an accident as severe as he did, yeah. it's not free R, so you don't get to just recover and move on. I wonder what the right. lingering issues with that uh, is as they head into the fight this Saturday. But boy, that's going to be a good one. And we've been waiting for that one for a real long Man, time. Can't wait. Corporate we got two great ones that night. Over the weekend, Titan yeah. FC produced a one-second knockout. However, it all started with a fake glove touch. DC, tap in or tap out on a fake glove touch leading to a KO. Hey, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. All right? This, you said You said you tap to out me, on DC. No, no, RC. I tap, I tap out on being doing something illegal, but I don't think that was dirty. I mean, the guy, you are not obligated to touch gloves. That is not a thing that you have to do. You got to stay ready. The first thing they tell you in the back is protect yourself at all times. You got to be ready. The guy comes out with his fist out, RC. The guy doesn't even, but the, the, hey, the opponent didn't even reach for his glove. Look at the video, run it back. He didn't even reach for his glove. It's not like his hand was down because he was trying to bump gloves okay, with him. DC, he just didn't pick up on the kick. I have, a, I, have a, I have a question, DC. The before, before rounds, I always see one of the guys or both of the guys go, they look at each other, they raise the hand and shake yep. their head as to acknowledge that we're going to tap gloves. If, you, if you, you're saying if you don't get that acknowledgement, you have to understand, just protect yourself at all times. Absolutely. RC, every time I slap gloves, RC, I would stand as far away from him and I did an open hand and I kind of like kind of smacked the hand. But I always made sure I was far enough to know that if they try some slick stuff, I would be able to defend myself. But I think what's getting lost in this, yeah. guys, is look at that video, RC. That guy with his right hand reached down for the kick. So he recognized what was going on. He just didn't defend it the right way. That dude made a mistake, and he's lucky. <laughs> Everybody thinks that it was an illegal kick. He didn't fake glove touch him. That dude reaches with his right hand, and he got kicked in the face. So, yes, horrible that it happened in that way. But that was his mistake, man. That dude messed up. That's why he got kicked. Corporate Jake, I ain't holding punches for nobody, RC. I'm sorry. All right, guys, last one. Prior to reporting for training camp, OBJ took to the gym to hit pads with former champ Kamar Usman. RC, tap in or tap out OBJ training MMA in the offseason? I tap in. This is something I did. I trained Kempo Jiu-Jitsu. I think it's great for any sort of athlete to train in MMA, but especially football players. It's a combat sport that is a step ahead of football as far as the physicality, but when you think about the cardio, the footwork, the ability to use your hands, especially someone who's going to be in those press sort of situations, I think this is an excellent training tool for any football player in the offseason. I tap in, RC. I tap in because even when you're fighting, right? Like catch, like a guy like me, right? You want to work hand-eye coordination. You would do tennis balls and you get things thrown at your face. You're trying to get your hands better. You're trying to get your things faster by just mixing up the training. I love that OBJ is doing something different to try to enhance himself as he gets ready to return from a long time away from the game. It's not like this yeah. guy was active. Yeah. He's been away. He's going to come back a better version of himself. And I believe that this mixed martial arts training and everybody that does it is a real beneficial thing to help you. Dude, I think every offensive lineman and defensive lineman in the NFL should be doing some MMA in the offseason. Yeah. You want me to tell you why I am a little skeptical of it? Because your nephew, Jordan Clark, takes Muay Thai now, and he keeps telling me, I got to fight, Dad. You know, I just got to do it at least one time. That's not what I want, DC. I don't want him to actually want to fight. I just want him to do the training in the offseason. Or see, I want you and him to fight. And I'm going to pick the opponent. We <laughs> talked about this in Vegas. No, I want both of y'all to fight. And I'm telling you, I'm going to protect y'all. I'm going to be your trainer. I'm going to make sure that you Wait. are ready to go, don't RC. Give me no wrestler, Dude, DC. there are not. I don't need a wrestler. I will not give you a wrestler. I will not give you a wrestler. I will get you a guy that you can stand and trade with, a guy that's going to let us show. <laughs> hey, hard body. Louisiana hard body, dog. You know what it is. <laughs>
<laughs> hey, listen, guys. Anytime you want to watch DC and RC, you can find us wherever you get your podcast at midnight on Tuesday, ESPN2. This is a huge week. We got the BMF title with Justin Gaethje, Dustin Poirier. Also, Alex Pajeda moves up to light heavyweight to take on Jan Bohovitz. I am RC. That is DC. We love bringing you this show. DC is definitely a BMF. This is DC and RC. Catch you next week.